My neighbours keep going into their garden and looking at something. I feel like there's a cat in there that they're not used to. The way they're acting, it's as if a woolly mammoth has turned up in the garden. Hi there, welcome back to Planet Property and thank you for joining me for today's video. So I thought today I'd talk you through my journey into my role that I'm in now, into becoming a chartered surveyor. I have to caveat that with I'm not actually chartered yet. I'm in the process of submitting and completing my assessment of professional competence to become fully chartered, but I will soon be a fully chartered surveyor because the way I see it is even if I get referred first time around, I will eventually become fully chartered because there's no dropping out at this stage. So yeah, my journey to becoming a chartered surveyor, working in the commercial property industry and just everything in between. So I suppose I'd better start with a little bit of context. So I am from a small town in the Midlands, nothing particularly exciting goes on there. It's one of the classic English Northern or Midlands towns that got left behind after the Industrial Revolution when the industry died out in the 1970s perhaps I would say, before I was born. I went to the local comprehensive school, I was in an enormous class, there were about there were 35-40 of us in a class. I wasn't super academically brainy, I wasn't getting A stars but I also wasn't naughty so therefore I kind of got lost in the middle a little bit and yeah I just never really knew what I wanted to do with, with my life after school. All I knew was I wanted to get out of Stoke, I wanted to do something different, go and see the world, see something a little bit different. So yeah, I wasn't overly academic, you could say. I was a sort of fairly standard B grade student and I got my GCSEs. And back when I was at school, God, that makes me sound so old. You were allowed to leave school at 16 and I actually hated school so much at this point that I wanted to leave when I was 16. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to leave. My mum was very much, you are not leaving school at 16, you're going to carry on with your education, don't particularly care about the fuss you kick up. So I went to the local further education college and I did A-levels, I did A-levels in English language, geography, media studies and psychology kind of dossed around a lot in the first year of a levels when i was 16 17. um in hindsight obviously i would do things very very differently now i just yeah i wasn't really feeling academics or school at that point just didn't really know what i wanted to do with my life i just kept going because back then i used i actually used to get paid to go to school because i was from a low-income family so when I went to college, you used to get either 10, 20 or 30 pounds a week just for attending college. You used to get your, your slip signed, your EMA slip signed, which I think it was called Educational Maintenance Allowance. And it was supposed to be, you know, to allow you to pay to get the bus to school or college. I used to spend mine on driving lessons. <laughs> so yeah, that was the only reason I really attended, but I was not studious at all. Didn't do very well in my first year. Uh, I can't remember what I got in my three subjects that I carried on, but I know I got an E in psychology. It was either a D or an E. I think it might have been a D actually, but it was obviously it wasn't very good. So I dropped psychology and I carried on into second year with English, geography and media. And I did actually really enjoy media and geography. I would kind of re-sparked my love because I kind of I did like geography at school. I just hated my teacher. I just... I never felt particularly inspired by him and I think I sort of carried on geography again through my mum's sort of, I don't want to say pushing, but she knew I liked it and she liked geography, she was good at it, so she was just sort of, when I was trying to pick my A levels, she was, well you know, why don't you do geography, go and speak to the tutory teachers at the college, see if you like it, and I did, I loved my geography teacher at A level, he was an absolute babe, loved him. So I wasn't a bigger fan of the physical side of geography, rivers, seas, coastal erosion. I liked human geography, I liked the idea of urban growth and population and this kind of thing. But what I really loved was English and media. I've always loved reading, always been a big reader. 
and I was really fascinated by what I was learning in English and media studies. So I originally wanted to do journalism at university. I even went to an open day for it at Liverpool University. Um, but I think sort of looking into career prospects a little bit more after that open day, I sort of realised that it was quite a hard field to crack. And as I say, my one ambition was to leave home, to go out into the big wide world. My eventual ambition after university was to go go and live in London and just do something down south and have fun, basically. <laughs> so I realised that perhaps journalism wasn't the career for me. I then toyed with the idea of doing law. Um, my tutor at college told me my grades were not good enough and I would never get onto a law degree. So that kind of shot that one in the water straight away. Then I started thinking, okay, what, what am I gonna do? I like human geography, I like English, I like writing. How, is there something I can do that involves all of that? And I love property programs. I love Homes Under the Hammer and Grand Designs and all this sort of proper English property programs where you go inside people's houses and look at them and see what kind of things they're doing to them to increase the value or whatever. So then I started looking into what I could do with a human geography degree and from there it became apparent that I could do another element, um, human geography and town planning. And the more I read into town planning the more I liked the idea of it. I liked the idea of place shaping and policy making and writing reports on on towns and buildings and properties and this sort of thing. I really thought that was interesting and I found a couple of degrees that offered the opportunity for a year in industry as part of the course and again with my ambition to just leave home and get out I thought that that would make me really really employable after my degree if I already had a year under my belt as opposed to just doing a three-year undergraduate course. So I applied for these degrees. Where did I apply to? I applied to Cardiff, Newcastle, and both of those did the placement year. Sheffield, Liverpool and Birmingham. And I did get offers from all of them because even though my A, my first year A level grades weren't particularly great, my pr predicted grades were a lot better because I'd obviously realised the importance of knuckling down and getting on with work in second year, so my coursework grades were pretty good. So I got offers from all of them and I put Cardiff down as my first choice. I want to say I put Newcastle down as my second choice, but I'm not sure if that's right. I might have put Sheffield down because, and this sounds really, really stupid. So the year that I was applying to uni was the year that reality TV really took off and Geordie Shore had just came out and it really scared me that that's what locals in Newcastle would be like if I went to uni there. I thought it was just really intimidating and I wouldn't be able to deal with that. So I think I actually put Sheffield down as my second choice. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter because I got into Cardiff. Now, I think it's worth here noting that because of the year that I went to university, I went in September 2012, and that was the year that the fees went from 3,000 to 9,000 a year for students studying in England. So I think there was a huge drop off of applicants, certainly from England that year. So even though I put in a lot of hard work in the final run up to my A-levels because of my first year and just messing around, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, just not really having a focus or a direction or anything. Plus, you know, when you're 16, 17, that's when you discover alcohol and boys. So all that meant that I came out of college with grades B, C, C which is, is really, yeah, it's not great. And the most frustrating thing about that in all three of my grades, I was only one or two marks off the next grade up. So in my head, I should have got ABB, but I was just a couple marks off in every single one. And to this day, that still really haunts me, to be honest with you. So if there's anyone who's 16 watching this, put the bloody work in in first year because you're 16, you can handle your hangover, go out on Friday night and then revise on Saturday. Because of the huge drop off of applicants, of English students that year, I got a place on the course with my grades and I went to Cardiff and I had 
the best time. I had so much fun. It was everything I wanted. So yeah, I had two amazing years in Cardiff. That was, it was great. Let's not talk about the fact that just because I was English, I was paying £9,000, whereas the people I was sat next to from Wales were only paying £3,000 for the exact same course. Let's just not. In my third year at university, I did a year out in industry, and I was applying for this during second year, and in hindsight, I didn't actually apply for that many positions. At the time, it felt really devastating because I received three rejections in a row, one of which was from TfL, Transport for London, which felt devastating because I just really wanted to work there. I loved the work they were doing. I loved the idea of the planning department. It was so interesting. Their offices were in central London. It was just so cool. It was exactly what I wanted. And one of the other girls from my course got a placement there. I actually can't even remember where I got rejected from on my placement year applications, but I know I got three rejections in a row, which felt soul destroying, especially at 19, 19, 20. I'd not really had much experience in the world yet. These were my first ever professional interviews I was doing. I'd had a semi-formal interview to get into university, but that was more just a, a bit of a chit chat with the course leader rather than a formal sit down, answer questions kind of thing. But I got offered a job at one of the councils in London and even though it wasn't my first choice I thought you know what I'm running out of options here I'm gonna take it and it was horribly paid it was zone 4 London but I had the most amazing year of my life that was the best thing I think I ever could have done was taking that offer that was made to me I moved in with like say the girl on my course who got the TfL placement, we lived together in our tiny little flat in an awful zone three area that was above a, what was the shop? It was a shop of sorts, I can't remember what the shop was. Might even have been an estate agents we lived above, hilariously, because we both worked in property. And again, in hindsight, looking back at some of the things that I said and did in that first job, it's so embarrassing, but I was 20 years old, I just, I didn't know the world or anything like this. I'm cringing just thinking about some of the outfits I thought it was appropriate to wear to work. After a year, I went back to uni and I did final year. And working for the year, again, like I say, it was the best thing I ever could have done working for that placement year because I'd had this work ethic instilled in me that I just didn't have in first and second year. I was still kind of carrying on my original college attitude to to learning and that oh I can do the essay the night before it'll be fine I'll just stay up all night cram it'll be fine and that that had worked for me I have no idea how I got pretty decent marks in first and second year that saw me through yeah, so I'd had this work ethic instilled in me from my year working which was you will work Monday to Friday nine till five in the library and if that's not sufficient you stay a little bit later on than five or you do a little bit of work on a Saturday but there's no more late late night than lying until two and then just dossing around watching a bit of Jeremy Kyle those those days are done we had our fun let's crack on now so it was really really good for me to have that sort of mental attitude of this is work time this is play time this is time with my family with my boyfriend whatever Finished final year, got a two on, which I'm so proud of. I worked really, really hard in final year for that mark. So I was really pleased with that. But I came out of uni with no job offers. I've been applying all throughout the last term for, for the graduate roles, for jobs in London, for anything I could get. And it was heartbreaking. I felt like I was the only person who didn't have a job offer because most of my friends who had come back for fourth year, so the ones who'd done the placement year, almost all of them got roles with their previous employer and that wasn't really an option for me because it was a council so they could only offer me a job if something came up. It wasn't sort of a, a, a known agreement that if you do your, your placement year here you will have a role to walk into when you graduate. So I've been applying for everything else, thinking that my my placement year would serve me really well, and it didn't. So I had to go back home after I graduated, 
which as I said my only ambition was to never go back home so that felt like the biggest failure in the world I felt like what was the point of the last four years if I've just wound up back where I am but it did actually work out at the time you know there were things that happened at the time in my personal life that meant it was really really good for me to be at home for a few months but I just couldn't handle it I got it got to the point where I came down the stairs one day with a suitcase packed and said to my mum take me to the station I'm going to London because very very fortunately I'm very lucky to be able to say this my brother lived in London and he and his wife were able to put me up in their house um I can't remember if I gave him any forewarning that I was turning up or if I rang him from the train and said prepare the sofa bed for me I I've left I'm coming but I just decided that the best thing to do was to be on the ground and one of my friends the one who I'd lived with in my placement year she'd been given her job back at TFL so she was looking for somewhere to live and I decided I was gonna live with her regardless of whether or not I had a job I then decided that I was going to London and was going to move in with her and one of our other friends and even if I didn't get a job in planning I would get a job in a bar or something just to carry on my independence. I felt like I'd completely lost my independence by moving back home and I hated it. But yeah, moved back to London, um, wasn't really getting anywhere with the job applications, got rejected from TfL again. Me and TfL don't have a good history. I applied for a couple of councils. I got offered a position as a contractor at a council and I took it because it was obviously it was a job offer. And in hindsight, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life because first of all, I hated the job. I hated the council. I had friends from when I was working at the previous council that I did my placement year at who'd warned me against this particular council and I sort of thought well beggars can't be choosers at this point they've offered me a job the money on paper seems good but oh my god if I'd have known what that involved I never would have taken it I was I was 22 at this point I didn't really have a great amount of life experience no one in my family owned their own business or anything like this. I didn't understand accounting or anything like that. And I had to set up a private limited company and I'm not gonna tell you the whole story because I hate it. The tax implications of being a contractor were horrific. But fortunately, a couple of weeks after I started that job, I got offered another job in a permanent role at another council, but it was a central London council this time. Really swanky offices exactly the kind of thing that I wanted to be doing, pretty decent pay. So I left the contracting job after seven whole weeks and went to start working at this new council. And while I didn't love the job, that was, that was great fun. That was exactly what I'd wanted and what I'd envisioned from being a young girl in Stoke. I made so many friends, I was going out, I was doing all these fun things in London. We lived in a great flat in a really lovely part of town. And yeah, that was just a great year, really, really good fun. I was there for just over a year. But as I say, I wasn't particularly enjoying the job itself. And I saw an advert come up for a position at the company I currently work at. And the position was for graduate town planner in the aim of seeing the candidate through their Royal Town Planning Institution APC because the RTPI does a similar APC to the RICS. So I applied for this job, I went to the interview and the chap sort of who interviewed me, they asked me loads of technical planning questions that I was able to answer just like that because I'd, I'd worked in three councils now, I've been working for two and a bit years in the council and they were sort of like, wow, okay, we weren't expecting anyone with this kind of experience or knowledge. Would you want this kind of level of job? Because it is right at the bottom of the ladder and it meant a small pay cut as well. And I just said, yes, I want out of where, I'm. well, obviously I didn't say that in the interview, but I said, yes, you know, I, I would really like this position. I like the opportunity to be supported in doing my RTPI submission because that was something I really wanted to do, but that isn't readily offered by the council. So took that job that was November 2017 I'm still there now 
three and a bit years later. So that's a good sign. A couple of months after I joined the company, the, the person who is now my manager joined the company and in my first one-to-one -one with him where I sat down and he and I discussed my academic and working history, he said to me, oh, you know, your degree is dual accredited. It's accredited with the RICS. And I said, oh yeah, you know, I, I knew that. I've never really looked into it too much. And he said, well, I'm dual accredited. I've, I've done, done it both myself. Would you ever think about doing it? And I was like, yeah, why not? You know, at this point, why, why not just say yes to these opportunities? Work were offering to pay to put me through it. There was a scheme in place, a graduate scheme for graduate surveyors to go through and do their, their APC. And I knew I could kind of piggyback on the back of that a little bit. So, yeah, I just signed up for it without ever really looking into it. You move out of London and you think you've escaped the sirens. They're everywhere. Three and a bit years later, here I am. I finished my town planning accreditation last year. So I'm now a fully chartered member of the Royal Town Planning Institution. Soon to be fully chartered surveyor. And if I'm honest, I just kind of fell into this. I never really envisioned that this was what I was going to be doing with my life. When I started my degree and when I started working, I always thought I just wanted to be a town planner and see where that took me. I now work in a far more sort of straddling role where I do I do, do town planning and I am a planning advisor in my in my company. But I also do a lot of development work and I do development appraisals and I really enjoy that. I, I enjoy working in commercial property development. I think it's absolutely fascinating. But this is where I feel like I was always supposed to be and I feel like. I should be and I've worked for it but yeah this was never the plan but I think I am an example of you don't need to be set on your goals at the age of 16 and you don't need to be the ac academically the brightest you need to put in the hard work and I did get lucky with some of my circumstances not TfL I've been rejected from them a grand total of three times let's not talk about TfL but obviously that rejection is just redirection and it put me on the pathway that I was supposed to be on and to the place I am now and I couldn't be happier. I am soon to be dual qualified at the age of, how old will I be, 26, 27? I don't think that's too bad from a girl from a small town in the Midlands where nothing is expected of you. So yeah, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So just keep going and if anyone wants any more information about what it's like working in commercial property development then just drop me a line and let me know. I'll see you all next time.